Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here tonight. <clears throat> it's a great, great turnout uh, for a Sunday night service. We appreciate all of you being here and uh, looking forward to, we've been looking forward to this trip, looking forward to the uh, potluck at the end and uh, the, the time of fellowship. And uh, we're just very thankful for this church and of course for Brother Jared and Miss Heidi and, and the family and all of you who uh, have, have just made this uh, possible and made this uh, church plant a success. Last time I was here, uh, it was just in January, I preached a sermon on the subject of how to treat your pastor's wife and family. And tonight I, I want to continue uh, kind of that, that idea. Um, but before I get started, let me say this. Be, please be in prayer for my family and I. We're going to be uh, traveling all week. Uh, we are here tonight. I was telling some of the guys before the service, we're here tonight. And, um, and tomorrow we're going to be uh, filming... We've taken on, Verity Baptist Church has taken on the second season of Landmarks. So we're going to be filming with Brother Jared at, in Yosemite and, uh, for, for the show. And actually, I was sitting there and I, I, I asked my wife, I said, is that Yosemite? I've never actually been to Yosemite. And she said, yeah, that's Half Dome. And I thought, good, this will make it a lot easier. We'll just film it here. And <laughs> we don't have to do it tonight. And uh, we'll have to take the day off tomorrow. But um, we're, we're going to be filming in, in the real Yosemite, all right, uh, tomorrow. And then on Tuesday, we're going to be filming uh, down at uh, one of these big redwood trees. Uh, on Wednesday, my family and I will be driving down to L.A., and I'll be doing a Rod of Iron podcast with uh, Pastor Mejia. On Thursday, I'll be preaching there in uh, First Works. And on Friday, we'll be driving back to Sacramento, Saturday, We'll be soul winning. Sunday we'll have church. And then on Monday I'll be in Lake Tahoe with Pastor Jones from Shield of Faith uh, recording uh, for Landmark. So it's a busy, busy uh, few days. So if you would pray for us and uh, we would appreciate your prayers, especially on the road and as we're driving. Uh, but like I said, last time I was here, I preached a sermon on the subject of how to treat your pastor's wife and family. And later on this year, just a few months from now, Lord willing, I will be ordaining uh, Brother Jared as the pastor of this church, of uh, an independent Baptist church here in Fresno. At that point, this church will no longer be a satellite. It'll be an autonomous church. And uh, it'll ha you'll have a pastor. you have a pastor's wife. you have a pastor's family. All of that. And that's why I preached that sermon last time I was here. Uh, my job as the pastor, especially as we, as we kind of finish this, in August, Lord willing, we will be uh, cutting the umbilical cord. This church will become a, an autonomous church. And to be honest with you, this may be the last time I come before we do that. I may have one more trip before that, but it's coming very close. And my job is to prepare you for that transition from a satellite uh, to a church plant to an independent autonomous church. And for that reason, I want to preach these sermons, not because there is a problem, because there is no problem, there hasn't been a problem, but I want to help you as a church transition from a satellite church with a local leader here under the authority of our church in Sacramento to an autonomous independent church with a pastor. And I want to teach you how to treat your pastor, how to work with your pastor, how to uh, uh, come alongside your pastor. So last time I preached a sermon called uh, How to Treat Your Pastor's Wife and Family. Tonight I'm preaching on the subject of how to treat your pastor. And I, I want to help you with that. You're there in Hebrews 13. I want you to notice that in Hebrews chapter 13, there's a theme that runs through the uh, chapter a little bit. If you look at verse 7, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7 says, Remember them which have the, notice this word, rule over you. Remember them which have the rule over you. If you look down to verse number 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you. If you look down to verse number 24, it says, Salute all them that have the rule over you. And through this chapter, we see this theme, and uh, the writer continually brings up this individual who has the rule, and I believe this is talking about the pastor and the pastor is the one who rules uh, within 
the church. What I've learned over the last 10 years of ministry is that oftentimes people need to be taught how to treat, how to deal, how to handle, uh, if that's oh, an appropriate word, uh, their pastor. You know, especially our type of churches. Our type of churches, for the most part, reach two types of people. And I'm not saying these are the only two types of people we reach, but primarily when we reach people, we reach people right off the streets. I mean, we knock their doors, we preach the gospel, we get them saved, we invite them to church, they come, they're unchurched, they're maybe haven't gone to a good church or don't know anything about church. And then what we also reach is a lot of people that we reach through social media, through the YouTube channels and, 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 and that, that arm of our ministry. And oftentimes those are people that maybe are already religious. They're going to a church, uh, but they're not maybe going to a good church. Maybe they get saved as a result and start learning good doctrine. A lot of times those people aren't going to church anywhere. They just find us online and they're learning and grasping a lot through the internet ministry, but they've never actually been part of an actual church, an assembly of, uh, of believers. And what I have found with both of these groups, and we love both groups, but what I found is that what we often have to do is teach them how to deal with a pastor, how to live within a congregation, because it's not something that comes natural. And that's the purpose of these sermons, is to try to teach you how to Treat your pastor, how to, uh, how to uh, uh, work alongside your pastor. Here's what I believe, and I'm going to get into the sermon here in a minute, but let me just finish this introductory point. What I believe is this, that every Christian should either be a pastor or be supporting a pastor. Every Christian should either be a pastor, and I don't mean that, that I think every Christian should be a pastor. I, I would say probably most Christians shouldn't be a pastor. Uh, there's, there's certain people that should be pastors, and they've got to meet certain qualifications, and we understand that. But here's what I believe. I believe that you're either a pastor or you're supporting a pastor. You're either a pastor or you are uh, putting yourself under the, because I believe that God wants every Christian in a local church. And therefore, God wants you under the authority of a pastor. So we should either be a pastor or be supporting a pastor. And hopefully, you want to support your pastor. Hopefully, uh, you want to support. Uh, you've supported me as your pastor over the last couple of years. And hopefully, you'll want to support your pastor once you have an ordained minister here. So I want to give you some thoughts tonight. I realize we've got a potluck, so we've got to move quickly. The snow cones are getting cold, is what I'm told. So we've got to hurry up. Uh, so that we can get to those. But I want to give you four thoughts tonight in regards to, on, uh, to how to treat your pastor's back, uh, uh, pastor's back, pastor's, how to treat your pastor in the back of your course of the week uh, or in the back of your bulletin, I should say. There's a place for you to write down some notes. Maybe you can write these things down. How to treat your pastor. How to treat your pastor. You say, one, once we have a pastor, once he's ordained, once we're autonomous, we're independent, what do we do? How do we treat him? What, what, how's this all going to work? Number one, when it comes to how to treat your pastor, you should obey your pastor. Now, I've already probably lost some people there, but that's okay. That's what the Bible says. Hebrews 13, look at verse 17 again. Obey. See that word? Obey them that have the rule over you. That word, rule, that uh, language means the one who is in charge, the one who makes the rules. He has the rule because he makes the rules. It says, obey them that have the rule over you. Notice this word, and submit yourself. The word submit means to put yourself under the authority. A lot of times in a Baptist church, when we see the word submit, we only like to bring that up in the context of marriage and make sure we tell those wives, you better be submitting to your husband. But you know, we all are to submit in different areas uh, in our lives of authority. Absolutely, wives should submit to their husbands. But you know what, men? You should go to work and submit to your boss. And, 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 uh, and submit under his authority and work under his authority. The Bible says, as unto the Lord. Children should obey their parents and submit their, to their parents. And, and, and we should all, we all have areas where God has given us uh, 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 ordained authority, God-given authority in our lives. And one of those areas is within the local church. The Bible says that God has placed the pastor as the authority in the local church, and it says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself. You say, why? Here's why. And here's what I know about Brother Jared, and here's what I know about any 
pastor or future pastor who's worth their salt, for they watch for your souls. You know what a good pastor does? He watches. He's vigilant. He's paying attention. He, he knows what you need. He's spending enough time around you to be able to, and I don't mean this in a way, and I hope you don't take it this way, it's not like we're just, you know, watching people and taking notes, and oh, there's, I got a sermon idea right there, look at that. That's not what we're talking about, but you know, we can't help but look at the people we've given our lives to. We can't help but love the people that God has given us to lead. And sometimes uh, 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 God allows us to see things, and whether it's in an individual or just a trans that come into churches in general, the Bible says that we are to watch for your souls. You, wait, you say, why? Notice, as they that must give account. You say, who does God hold accountable for the local church? The answer is, the answer to that question is always the leader. Who does God hold accountable in the home? The leader. Who ate of the tree of the garden, uh, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Eve did. She gave to her husband Adam. But who's blamed all throughout the Bible? Adam. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Wait a minute, what about the woman? Didn't she eat first? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, God always holds the leader accountable. And in church, it is the leader, it is the pastor, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable. Notice, he says, why do you want to obey the pastor? Because the pastor is watching for your souls, because he must give an account for what happens here at this church. But he says, you know what, at the end of the day, that is unprofitable for you. It is in your best interest to obey your spiritual leader. And by the way, in any area, Kids, let me tell you something. It's in your best interest to obey your parents. Wives, it is in your best interest to submit to the authority of your husband. Church members, it is in your best interest to submit to your pastor. You say, well, how should we treat our pastor? Well, number one, you should obey your pastor. Notice verse 7 of the same chapter there, Hebrews 13 and verse 7. Remember them, notice the words, which have the rule over you. They have the rule over you. They are the rulers. Now you say, well, what exactly is this referring to or talking about? I'd like you to keep your place there in Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to come back to Hebrews 13 through the sermon. But go with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 20. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20. Do me a favor. When you get to Acts 20... Put a ribbon or a bookmark or something there because we're going to leave it and we're going to come back to it later on in the sermon. Acts chapter 20. You should have your place in Hebrews 13. Acts chapter 20. When we say you ought to obey your pastor, what do we mean by that? Well, it means that you ought to obey the, 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 the pastor's rules for the church. So literally you say, do you mean you know, in, a, in a spiritual sense should we obey the pastor? No, I mean it quite literally. The pastor sets the rules. He's the ruler he sets the rules. You ought to obey his rules, obey the pastor's rules for the church. See, the pastor's authority extends to anything under the canopy of the local church which he pastors. Are you there in Acts 20? Look at verse 28. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. The Bible says this, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to a group of elders. He's speaking to a group of pastors. He says, take heed therefore unto yourselves. And then he says this, and to all the flock. What's the flock? The flock is the congregation, the, the, the assembly of believers that God has put us over. He says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Notice these words. Over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. The word overseer means to be someone who supervises, someone who looks over. And by the way, let me say this. Notice, who makes the pastor the overseer? It is the Holy Ghost. This is why we call it God-given authority. 
You say, oh no, pastor, you're going to make Brother Jared the pastor of this church. I may be the human vessel that physically lays hands and ordains him into the ministry, but it is the Holy Ghost that uh, will set him here. It is the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit of God that has brought him here, that has built this place, that has brought this congregation together. It is God that has done these things. When, the, when Paul and Silas were sent off into the ministry, yes, there were men that physically laid their hands, but the Bible tells us that the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me, Paul and Silas. It's God's man, God's position, God's authority. God's the one that's put in there. But I want you to notice, it says that the Holy Ghost has made you, Paul speaking to preachers, he says, has made you overseer to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The context is about the church. Who's the overseer? Who's the authority? Who's in charge? Who's the one that needs to give an account? Who's the one that God holds accountable? Who's the one that God holds responsible? See, I want you to understand this. It is the pastor who sets the rules for the church. His authority extends to anything under the canopy of the church. Keep your place there in Acts uh, chapter number 20. Go back, uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. If you kept your place in Hebrews, continue to keep your place in Hebrews, but go to James and then 1 Peter. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. Let me make this clear. And again, this is going to be maybe a, a, a very educational sermon. But I want you to understand. You say, how do we treat the pastor? How does this all work? Because sometimes people get this idea. And people will come to our church and a lot of times they're new Christians or they've never just been part of a church that is a, a strong pastor-led church. Our type of churches, independent, fundamental Baptist, we are... We try to model biblical Christianity. We try to follow the, what the Bible says. And the Bible teaches that churches are to be pastor-led. We're not, we're not elder-led in the sense that there's a board of elders. We're not deacon-led. We're dead sure not uh, lady-led. You know, we, we have a strong male spiritual leader called a pastor. We are a pastor-led church. But sometimes people come to a church like ours, and they don't realize, and I'm just trying to help you and make sure you understand this. The pastor-led church, the pastor has the authority over the canopy of anything that falls under the umbrella of the local church. Because sometimes people get this idea. They get the idea that says, well, pastor just preaches. Pastor gets up to preach. He's the one that writes the sermons. He decides what Bible study we're going to do. He decides what personality he wants to rip on or whatever, right? Um, I'm an advocate. I don't know if you've preached on that yet, but you better say nice things. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, de he decides uh, all, all the things he's, he's going to preach about, but, you know, his authority extends to there. And then we as church members can just kind of run wild with anything else. We can do whatever we want, and we can, you know, do this and do that and start this ministry and have this, uh, 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 you know, Bible study. Let's start this Friday night Bible study in my living room. No. Anything that falls under the authority of this local church. What are we talking about? We're talking about the preaching of God's word, the teaching of God's word, soul winning, any event. Anything that falls. Look, if you can do it as a result of your connection to this church, that's his authority. His authority does not extend only through preaching. Our influence is done through preaching. But his authority, his rulership, falls under the canopy of the church. So you ought to obey the pastor's rules for the church. Quite literally, his authority extends to anything under the canopy of this local church. Now, there's a limit to that. What's the limit? 1 Peter chapter 5, are you there? His authority, because you say, I don't know, this sounds a little, uh, you know, is this like a cult? Is this uh, di dictatorship? You know? Are they just going to run my life? And the pastor is going to tell me everything, what to do? His authority, let me be clear, extends to anything under the canopy of the local church. And for sake of clarity, his authority does not extend to anything outside of the local church. 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 1. Notice Peter. He says, the elders, referring to himself. Peter was a pastor. He says, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder 
and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Notice he says, feed the flock of God which is among you. So this is Peter, who's an elder, talking to other elders. He says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Notice, it's a consistent theme throughout the Bible. The pastor is the overseer. He's to take the oversight. He is the ruler. Taking the oversight thereof. Then he says this, not by constraint, okay, we're not a cult, we're not going to force you to do anything. He says, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, our motivations are right, we're not doing it for money, but of a ready mind. Notice verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the, to the flock. What does this mean? It means that we are not to dictate into the lives of God's people. See, at the end of the day, a pastor, you know, we may call it my church, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. This is my church. I should take ownership. You know, I love Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento. I love this church as well. Uh, uh, but, you know, my church, the church that the, we start these churches with the idea that we will cut the umbilical cord and make them independent. The church in Sacramento is not getting rid of me that easily. And, uh, you know, I love that church. It is my church. And I don't mean that in an ownership way, I mean that in, 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 uh, in, in a part that I'm part of the family. It's, it's part of our church, and, uh, and, though, and, and I love our people. And sometimes we as preachers say, they're my people. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But we do have to realize that they really are God's people. Amen. And our authority extends within the church, but not outside the church. Now, we love you, but we're not going to tell you what to do at home. Now, we may preach what you should do at home, but we're not going to enforce what you should or should not do, wear or should not wear, watch or should not watch. We'll preach that with our authority here at church. We'll say, hey, God wants you to not, to, to not watch certain things and not listen to certain things and not go certain places. But we're not going to force you to do that because, see, the pastor's authority, it extends to the local church. So anything done in and, in and out of the local church falls under the authority of the pastor. Sometimes people, they don't understand that. They, they, they hear that. We'll teach that to them. And they think, oh, no, you guys are kind of dictators. I've had people, uh, you know, come to our church and say, oh, we, we, we want to have a wedding ceremony at, uh, at Very Baptist Church. And, Pastor, we'd like you to do the wedding. And it's like, okay, well, we'd like to do that. You know, let's sit down and talk about some rules, right, with the ruler. And, you know, you start telling them, no, we're not going to play Celine Dion, and no, we're not going to, you know, have a dance, and no, we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do that. And, and uh, you know, young couples look at me all sad and say, you're ruining our wedding. I say, well, there's, there's a misunderstanding. It's my wedding. <laughs> you just get to be a part of it. Because the authority of the pastor, hey, I'm the one that's going to have to give an account to God for the type of music that's played in our church. I'm the one that's going to have to stand before God and give an account for the dancing that was allowed and, and the things that were done. And obviously, we don't try to ruin. I mean, it's always fun to ruin, you know, new, new, uh, newlyweds weddings or whatever. But, you know, that are, the goal is not to ruin your life. But the point is this. That's the authority of the pastor. We're, you say, oh, we'd like to have this event or that event at church. Well, we're not going to allow for certain music. And we're not going to do. We'll have a funeral, but you're not going to bring alcohol. That's the authority of the church. That's the authority of the pastor. But we're not going to go to your house and dump out the alcohol. Now, if you, had any, if you were worth anything as a Christian, you'd go home and dump out the alcohol. Amen. But we're not going to physically show up and, and tell you, you know, do this and do that. See, the authority of the pastor extends under the canopy of the church, but it does not extend outside of the canopy of the church. So when we say, obey your pastor, we mean obey the rules he has for this church. Obey the things that he's declared that he wants done here. But there's another thought. Go back to Hebrews 13. Keep your place there in, 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 in uh, well, I'm sorry, excuse me, you don't have to keep your place there. Okay? You, you have your place in Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews 13. You should have your place in Acts, but Hebrews 13. When we say obey the pastor, we mean that you ought to obey the pastor's rules for the church, literal. But we also mean that you should obey the pastor's preaching for the church spiritually. Hebrews 13, look at verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have, notice these words, 
who have spoken unto you the word of God. Isn't that what a pastor does? They have the rule over the church, but they also stand up and they speak the word of God. Brother Jared gets up here three times a week, opens up the word of God, and expounds it upon uh, uh, unto you. Uh, the Bible says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of the their conversation. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 5 if you would. You're there in Hebrews. Just go back. James and 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, excuse me. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. Notice the, word, again, the words, Feed the flock of God. This is what pastors are told to do. The flock is the congregation of believers. What are we to do? We are to feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 2, if you would. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Our job is to feed you the word of God. You've heard this before. I'm sure you've heard it before. And I want you to understand how it works. When you got saved... We're going to look at a couple verses here in a minute. When you got saved, you, became a, you, you, you were a new creature. The Bible says, therefore, uh, you know, when we become, when we place our faith in Christ, when we receive Christ, we become the sons of God. We become a new creature. And when you became the son of God, when you became the daughter of God, you were a babe in Christ. You were a baby. And then our job is to help you grow. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Go, to, go back to Hebrews chapter 5 if you would. See, you come to church like this, and we begin to feed you the word of God. This is why we actually preach the Bible around here. You say, oh, don't all churches preach the Bible? Have you been to other churches? I mean, I'm talking about even good, independent, federal Baptist churches. You get there, you get one verse, and then 40 minutes of who knows what. You know, and I'm not against illustrations, and I'm not against stories, and I'm not against those things. But our job is to preach the Word of God. Amen. Paul said, preach the Word to Timothy. He said, be instant in season, out of season. See, you say, why do you preach the Word of God? Here's why we preach the Word of God. Because we are to Feed the flock as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word of God that ye may grow thereby. See, you grow through the word of God. Hebrews 5 in verse 13 says this, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Hebrews 5, 13. Now look, here's how it works. You show up to a church like this, and you start learning things. We teach you about salvation. We teach you about baptism. We teach you about church membership. And, 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 and as you grow, you start off with the milk of the word, and then you start learning some heavier things. We might start teaching you about uh, separation, start teaching you about dress standards, start teaching you about prophecy, and start teaching you all sorts of different things and, and the things that God wants you to learn and grow. See, it is the word of God that helps you grow. That's why the Bible says that the ruler is the one who has spoken unto you the word of God. And you grow as you learn and apply the Word of God. And it's not just learning. You must apply it. Look at verse 13 again. Hebrews 5, 13. For everyone that useth. You see the word useth there? It's not enough to have it. You got to use it. For everyone that useth the milk is unskillful in the Word. Why? When, how do we know when you're new, a, a, a babe in Christ? And look, being a babe in Christ has nothing to do with your physical age has nothing to do with how long you've been saved. I'm about to show you. You say, well, how, how do I know when I'm mature as a Christian? Here's how you know. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the Word. When you're unskillful in the Word, you can't handle the Word of God. You, you say, what do you mean? Here's what I mean. You can't, on Monday morning, get up, grab the Bible, open it, and read it for yourself. You say, well, anybody can do that. Oh, really? Are you doing it? Because most Christians haven't read the Bible cover to cover one time. Well, anybody can do that. That's not what I'm asking. I'm not saying, can you do it? I'm asking, are you doing it? Because when you are skillful in the Word, that's maturity. See, a baby has to be fed. Right? Children don't feed themselves. Babies don't feed themselves. You've got to feed them. You've got you to give them the milk. And we have no problem doing that. You come to a church like this, we'll feed you milk. We'll feed you the Word. 
Notice, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. See, eventually a baby doesn't have to be fed milk anymore because they start maturing and growing and they start grabbing for stuff. And they start feeding themselves and we as parents teach them how to feed themselves and they become a full age. Even those, how, how does that happen spiritually? Here's how. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You say, Pastor Jimenez, how do I know if I'm a mature Christian? You know you're a mature Christian when you can start feeding yourself spiritually. You're mature. When the only time you get the Word of God fed to you is when Brother Jared feeds it to you here at church, you're a babe. I'm not saying that to offend you. I just, I'm just wanting, I want you to understand where you're at spiritually. You say, well, once I start, once I start you know, feeding myself, I don't ever have to come uh, to church. Well, here's the thing. Once babies start feeding themselves, they might be able to, to start, you know, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and these, you know, older kids or whatever, and they start feeding themselves, but they still need mama, right? Because cause, just because a six-year-old can feed themselves doesn't mean they're going to feed themselves well. A six-year-old can go into the cupboard and grab a bag of Cheez-Its and, you know, uh, put a, maybe, maybe an eight-year-old can put a bag of popcorn in the microwave and eat it, but, but they need mom and dad there to make sure they eat their green beans and, and eat their broccoli and, and, and get some good protein, right? So look, even in the growth, you say, well, I, start, I, start, you know, I started uh, uh, reading the Bible on my own. Well, praise the Lord. I hope you have. I hope you will. You say, I started with the book of Proverbs. Great. I started with the book of John. Great. I started with the book of Psalms. Awesome. I started with the Gospels. Praise the Lord. But, you know, you need a brother Jared to get you through the book of Judges. You need a pastor to get you through the book of Ezekiel. You need a pastor to get you through the book of Leviticus. See, we, we teach you the word of God. We help you grow. And then uh, this is how you grow as a Christian. We preach the word of God to feed you the word of God to help you grow. We teach the entire word of God. Acts chapter 20, if you can, go back there. Acts chapter 20, verse 27. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, notice what the Apostle Paul says. He says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. One of my goals as a pastor of Verity Baptist Church is to preach through every verse of the Bible to our church family. You say, why? That I might stand up one day and say, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer to feed the church of God. You say, how do I treat my pastor? Well, you ought to obey the pastor's rules for the church. The pastor may have some things he wants for this church, and his authority does not extend outside of this ministry. But within this ministry, you ought to obey him. But you know what else? You ought to obey his preaching. When he stands up and preaches the word of God, you ought to obey it. You ought to do it. Please understand this, and don't take this the wrong way. And I don't mean for it to sound the wrong way, but we do not preach to be heard. We preach to be obeyed. We preach for application. We don't preach to be heard. We don't stand up here and preach so that people could stand, you know, walk up to us after the service and say, that was a great sermon, that was the greatest sermon I've ever heard. Now look, we appreciate it when people say that. Don't, we're not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's wrong for you to say that. If it's a great sermon, it was a blessing to you. Go ahead and let Brother Jared know. But you know what? Then go home on Monday and do it. Amen. Obey it. It's for your benefit. Amen. Obey them that have the rule over you. and Submit yourselves, for they watch for your soul. I think, Pastor, I think Brother Jared was preaching that at me. Well, who else was he preaching? The ghost? <laughs> Why, why, why is he preaching it? You know, he, he presented that. And by the way, let me just say this. Anytime a pastor preaches something, you're like, I think he was preaching that at me. There's like five people in the church that uh, that applies to. <laughs> pastor said something about whatever. Pastor said something about smoking. There's like five people in our church that smoke. Calm down. <laughs> but even if you're the only one, you need to hear it. Amen. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy. And that's profitable for you. So you say, what do I do with my pastor? You got to obey him. You got to obey his rules. You got to obey his preaching. 
He's trying to help you grow. He's trying to help you mature. Go, go back to Hebrews 13. While you turn there, let me just read to you from Ephesians chapter 4. You don't have to turn here. I'll read Ephesians chapter 4. You go back to Hebrews 13. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says this, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Here he's talking about positions of spiritual leadership. He says he gave some pastors and teachers for what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints. The word perfect means to make complete, to make whole. It's not, we use the word perfect like there's, it's impu like there's no, nothing wrong with it. That's not the way that our King James Bible used the word perfect. The word perfect or, uh, means to, to make it complete, to make it whole. Why did God give you pastors and teachers, right? You have a pastor. His name's Pastor Jimenez right now. You have a teacher. His name's Brother Jared. One day your teacher will be your pastor. But you'll have other teachers. Why did God give you those? For the perfecting, for the maturing, for the completing of the saints. You need to grow. You don't have it all put together. Look, and you never will have it all put together. The Apostle Paul, probably the greatest Christian other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest Christian who ever lived, said, I have not yet attained. Amen. Well, what are we trying to do? We're trying to help you grow for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. A complete man. By the way, that's what, that's what the Bible says in the book of Job. When the Bible says that Job was a perfect man, it doesn't mean he was sinless. It means he was a mature, well-balanced Christian. He was a perfect, notice, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, don't turn there. The Bible says this, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. You got to obey your pastor's preaching. Let me give you a second one tonight. I said, number one, you should obey your pastor. Number two, you should follow your pastor. How to treat your pastor, you got to follow him. Are you there in Hebrews 13? Look at verse 7 again. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who has spoken unto you the word of God. Notice these words, whose faith follow. Whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. What does that mean? It means that you ought to follow the direction of the church. Notice it says, whose faith follow. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, you don't have to turn there. Paul said this, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Spiritual leadership, sometimes people attack pastors and say, why should I follow you? I, you know, I need to only follow uh, God. Well, you know, I need to only follow Christ. Well, you, Paul said, hey, be followers of me, even also as I am a follower of Christ. You ought to follow your spiritual leadership as they follow their leadership, their head. As they follow, of, of course, as we all follow Christ and as we follow the, the Word of God. And, 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 but the Bible says here, that you ought to follow their faith, whose faith follow. Now, what does that mean to follow their faith? Well, first of all, it means that you ought to follow their direction for the church. You know that different churches have different directions? Different churches have different uh, 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 things that they're doing. That's okay. Now look, every church needs to do certain things. We all need to be the, the, the pillar and ground of the truth. We all need to preach the Word of God. We all need to go soul winning. We understand that. But with that, there is some uh, 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 wiggle room for churches to have different uh, sorts of uh, things that may, they might focus on. You know, some churches may focus on, on, on media and, and making videos and documentaries and things like that. Does the Bible require us to do that? The Bible does not require us to do that. Could somebody be a successful pastor and never put out a video that gets 173,000 views on YouTube? Of course they could. But, you know, some churches have decided to make that part. It's something that God has allowed them to do, something that they can reach people with. There's nothing wrong with that. Our church has 
uh, uh, a little prison ministry, and I won't take the time to tell you the story, but a lot of it had to do with uh, uh, a family in our church that uh, helped us get that going, and you know, it started with us writing letters to one person we loved in prison, and to, today, up to this point, I think we've got 47 uh, people who we send transcribed sermons to every week in prison uh, all over this country. And I hope that number one day is 100. I hope that number one day is 500. I hope that number one day is 1,000. We might need some help, you know, if that happens. Do, do it. Does every church in America have to send transcribed sermons to prisoners? No, but it's something we're doing. There are some things that all churches should be doing, and then there's other things that not every church needs to be doing. You know, different churches have different flavors. They have different uh, uh, things that they may want to do uh, as a ministry. And, you know, it, when it comes to your church... You ought to let the pastor set the tone. You ought to let him set the direction. Every year at our church, we take a special offering. We call it the vision offering. Well, you're taking it this coming Sunday. We're taking it in Sacramento. This morning in Sacramento, I preached my annual vision offering sermon. And our vision offering is not us just trying to raise money. Our vision offering is me really casting a vision for our church what we want to do and the goals we have and the things we'd like to accomplish and then of course motivating to raise money to accomplish those things to do those things but let me tell you something sometimes people show up to church and they say oh no, no no you know pastor you preach and let's go in this direction let's do this and let's do that but you know what you ought to do as a church member is you ought to figure out what direction are you going let me follow your faith whose faith follow you set the direction you cast the vision and let me help you got to follow your pastor. Follow his direction. And there's nothing more frustrating. Over the last 10 years of ministry, we have some great people in Sacramento. God has given us some of the greatest people in Sacramento that has made up our church and Verity Baptist Church. But let me tell you something. There's, something, there's nothing more frustrating than having to fight and kind of butt heads with church people that are trying to take the direction of the church in a different way. Don't do that. All churches are different. All churches are different. At our church, there's something that we've, we've done, something that works for us. This in Sacramento actually does not work here in Fresno. It may work here in the future. You know, all churches are transitioning as well. Brother Jared and I had a conversation about this recently, but in Sacramento, I push for Saturday soul winning. Now, we have Thursday soul winning, we have Sunday soul winning, we have other times for soul winning, but I push for our main soul winning group to go out on Saturday morning. That works for us. It works very well for us. We get a lot of visitors as a result. Here in Fresno, it's a little different. Sunday seems to be more of the big day, and you guys get a lot of visitors on Sunday night. I wouldn't try to fight that. I just realized that's how it is here, and I'd get on the man of God's vision and, and try to help him with that. You know, but in Sacramento, for us, I try to push uh, 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 Saturday soul winning. The Lord has blessed us over the last several weeks. We've had uh, uh, somewhere between 90 and 110 soul winners out every Saturday morning. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate people following my vision in regards to that. Over the years, though, my wife and I have had to confront some people. Look, if people don't want to go on Saturday and they want to keep their Saturday open for whatever they want to do, that's fine with us. No problem. We got Thursday soul winning for you. We got Sunday soul winning for you. That's not a problem at all. We're not going to tell you what to do in, in your personal life. But when people make it their agenda and start going to soul winners and saying, hey, don't go on Saturdays. Let's all go on Sunday. Don't go on Saturday. Why are you trying to fight the pastor's vision? And I'm not saying that every church has to go so, and I'm just saying that's what we've chosen to do. So why don't you just get on the pastor's vision? You know, when Brother Jerry's the pastor here, why don't you just figure out what's he doing? What's he pushing? What's his agenda? What has God called him to do? What, what, what direction is he going? And then you get behind that and you say, I'm going to follow you. Amen. Whose faith follow, you ought to follow his direction. You ought to follow your pastor's direction for uh, the church. But you ought not only follow his direction for the church, you ought to follow his direction in life. Look down at Hebrews 13 again. Look at verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Then he says this, considering the end of their conversation. 
The word conversation means their lifestyle, their behavior, their way of life, their personal lifestyle. The Bible says that you ought to be able to look at your pastor and consider the end of his conversation. See, a pastor is to be an example. Go back to 1 Peter if you would. You're there in Hebrews, just uh, go to James and 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and look at verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 3. I apologize, I'm only on the second point. We may need to put those, that, those ice, uh, we may need to put those on, on ice. Because uh, I'm going to be a little while. 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 3. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, notice these words, but being in samples to the flock. He said, what's your job as a pastor? One of my jobs is to be an example to the flock. My wife is to be an example to the flock. Brother Jared, Miss Heidi, their family is to be an example to the flock. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read this for you. 1 Timothy 4, 12 says, let no man despise thy youth. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. This is a pastoral epistle. This is Paul speaking to a pastor. He says, let no man despise thy youth. And by the way, that's why we know that spiritual maturity has nothing to do with physical age. Timothy was a young man, but yet he was an elder. When I got into ministry, I was a, a very young man. Today, I like to think I'm a young man, but I'm getting older every day. But, but Paul told Timothy, he said, hey, let no man despise thy youth. He says, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And notice, he says, be an example not to the believers, but of the believers. So what does that mean? See, people think, oh, the pastor, he's an example to the believers. So that means that he has to have this high standard in life, and, and we're going to criticize him if he doesn't, and then we all get to kind of, you know, lack a little bit. No, no, no. The pastor's not an example to the believers. He's an example of the believers. Which means that you ought to look at him and say, hey, what pastor's doing with his family, that's what I should be doing with my family. Amen. Hey, how pastor works, that's how I ought to be working. Hey, how, uh, what pastor's doing, that's what I ought to be doing. See, you say, how do I treat my pastor? You ought to obey him, but you ought to follow him. Right. You ought to follow his direction for this church, and you ought to follow his direction in life. Right. Be thou an example of the believer. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I said tonight, number one, you should obey your pastor. Number two, you should follow your pastor. Number three, you should provide for the physical needs of your pastor. Now this point, I want to give a disclaimer. I'm not saying this needs to happen immediately. And in some cases, it may never happen. We're talking, of course, about a pastor being full-time, having the church provide for their physical needs. A pastor does not need to be full-time. For the first four years of our ministry in Sacramento, I worked a full-time job, and you know that didn't make us any less of a church. And there are situations where a pastor may never uh, uh, go into full-time, uh, into that full-time capacity. That doesn't make them any less of a pastor. But what I believe is this, that if the church grows, and if the church is able to, and if the pastor wants to, the church should not only obey them, should not only follow them but the church should provide for their physical needs now Paul gives us some arguments for how you know providing for the needs of your pastor look at 1st Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 first I, I like Paul he, he's, he's, he's very good at uh, systematically putting down an argument first he begins with the logical argument the logical argument is just this. He says, look, you ought to pay your pastor. You ought to provide for the needs of your pastors. He says, it just makes logical sense. He says, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, who goeth to warfare at any time at his own charges? I was in the military. Many of you were uh, in the military. And when you're in the military, you know, nobody, nobody says, hey, go, go to Qatar, go to Afghanistan, but buy your own ticket. And, and you know, try to get a gun. And, you know, some bullets would be good. If you can find one, a helmet, preferably not a bike helmet, but, you know, something. He says, who goeth, who goeth a war any time of his own charges? 
Look, when somebody sends somebody off to war, they provide what they need to go fight that battle. Paul's just giving the logical argument he's here. He says, who goeth a war at any time at his own charges? Then he gives another example, logical. He says, who planted the vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Anybody plant a vineyard and not eat from the fruit that comes from that vineyard? Now, you may not eat all the fruit. You might use some of it and sell some of it and, and, and do other things. But generally speaking, when someone plants a vineyard, they eat of the fruit thereof. And who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Notice verse 8. Say I these things as a man? See, because Paul's given us this logical argument, but he says, hey, don't, don't confuse my logical argument as the logic of man. He said, I'm not just saying this as a man, or saith not the law the same also. He said, doesn't God's law teach this concept as well? Now he's about to quote the word of God, verse 8. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. Then in verse 9, he quotes the Old Testament. He says, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. He goes back and he pulls out, and I, you know, I'm kind of offended at Paul because he's like, you know, let me tell you something. God says you got to provide for the needs of your pastor. And people would say, well, where does the Bible say that, Paul? And he says, well, doesn't the Bible say muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn? And then, you know, we as pastors are like, thanks, Paul. You're calling us an ox. But here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, look, when, you, when an ox goes out into the field and it's plowing and it's working, don't muzzle its, ox, its mouth. Don't cover its mouth so that it cannot eat. He said, while it's working, allow him to eat. Provide for its physical needs. Paul's saying, feed the ox. He said, my pastor's kind of an ox. Okay, we'll feed him. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Is Paul some sort of like animal rights guy? No, notice verse 9. Doth God take care for oxen? He says, Paul says, look, God didn't say that because he's really worried about the oxen. Although it makes sense to not just work your ox and not feed your ox and give water to your ox. Look at verse 10. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. Look at verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? You come to a church like this, you say, wow, I've learned so much. Wow, my life has changed. Wow, my life has transformed. Man, ever since I started coming here, I've been learning and I've been growing and, and God's been helping me and the preaching of the Word of God has really transformed my life. Well, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Here's what he's saying. If your pastor is providing for you spiritually, then why won't you provide for him physically? See, the biblical argument for providing for the needs of your pastor is that you should not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. This concept is found all throughout the Bible. Keep your place right there in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5 if you would. Find all the T books. They're all clustered together. 1 2 Thessalonians, 1 2 Timothy, Titus, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17 says this. Let the elders, those are the pastors, let the elders that rule well. By the way, let me just say this. Not all pastors are created equal. Some rule better than others. I, I'm, I'm very happy when I come to Fresno and I see how well run this church is. Sometimes, and don't ask me where because I won't tell you, I go preach, the Lord has allowed me to preach in different places and go, and sometimes every once in a while I'm just kind of like, you know, it's not, this, I'm not the pastor here, just, just don't, don't pay attention. You know, service starts at 7 and it actually starts at 7.15, you know, those kind of things, you know. Uh, I don't know if I'm an advocate or type A or what, I'll have to listen to Brother Jared, but um, the Bible says let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. You, know, you can tell when somebody labors in the word and doctrine. Right. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. 
Now there's a context. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. You ought to provide for the needs of your pastor. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 if you would. The church ought to provide for the needs of the pastor. Eventually. If, if, if it grows to that place, if it's needed, it should not be opposed to that. Sometimes people get this idea, we're not going to pay the pastor. You know, the Bible teaches, you say, how should I treat my pastor? Well, you ought to obey him. You ought to follow him. You ought to provide for his physical needs. And I, I said this recently. I was preaching in Boise, and I, 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 I said this. And, and, and I don't think it's wrong if people say this, but, you know, people have to say, like, oh, we pay the pastor. We pay the pastor to preach. Sometimes people say to me, oh, we, you know, you get paid to preach. And, you know, sometimes I joke around with people. Sometimes I don't say anything, but, you know, sometimes I'll joke with people and say, what does that even mean? You pay me to preach? Like, if the sermon's good, you know, $49.99, but if it's not good, then you get like a 10% discount? Like, what, what do you mean? You get paid to preach. You know, every once in a while, you get a blue light sale, and sermon's 50% off. You know, you don't pay the pastor to preach. You provide for his physical needs so that he can do the work that God has called him to do. And our job is to provide. While, while, while the ox is working, don't muzzle his mouth. So we ought to obey the pastor. We ought to follow the pastor. We ought to provide for the pastor. I told you to go to 1 Thessalonians. I'd like, you to, I'd like you to go there. Keep your place right there. But go back to 1 Corinthians 9 if you would. Let me just read these verses to you real quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12. Look at verse, actually, look at verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Do ye not know that they, he's going to give, he, he gave an argument for providing for the needs of the pastor, now he's going to give the process. How does this happen? He says, do ye not know that they, talking about the Levitical priesthood, that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they that wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. He, he's talking about the Old Testament Levites, the priests. He says, look, in the Old Testament, people would bring of their tithes and their offerings to the temple, to the tabernacle, to the storehouse. And the spiritual leaders there, the priests and the Levites, they would work in that. Some of that would be used to have uh, uh, a feast days with the congregation. Some of that would be used for things that needed to be done. But they would also eat from that. That's how they got paid. And he says this is the pattern for how you pay the pastor. Look at verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. See, eventually, eventually, the offerings, the tithes and offerings that come into a church, yes, those are used for events. Yes, those are used for this uh, event and that event and, and a ladies' tea or a married couple sweetheart banquet or whatever. But also from that, you ought to provide for the needs of your pastor. And you ought to be generous with your pastor. The Bible says they're worthy of double honor. Especially they that labor in the word and doctrine. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're talking about how to treat your pastor. Number one, you ought to obey your pastor. You ought to obey his rules. He sets the rules for the church. But you ought to obey his preaching as well. We won't force that, but it's in your best interest. You ought to follow your pastor. You ought to follow his direction for the church. And you ought to follow his direction in life. You ought to provide for the needs of your pastor. Let me give you the fourth one. We'll finish up. How to treat your pastor. You should appreciate your pastor. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them. To know them which labor among you. Don't ever, don't ever say this. Well, what does pastor do all week anyway? You know what God says that it's your job to know them which labor among you? I mean, pay attention. Sometimes people show up to churches and they're like, wow, look at this beautiful event, this married couple of sweetheart banquet. Look at all these decorations and the nice, uh, you know, we, we get these nice pictures taken and this and that. Look at all these things. And they think, you know, did that just come out of nowhere? Pastor must have some great faith. He walked into an empty room, got on his knees, prayed, and poof, you know, it all appeared. 
That'd be nice if it happened that way, but you know, usually when events happen, somebody was there the night before making it happen. Somebody was there getting it ready. When the man of God stands up to preach, he spent hours during the week preparing, reading, thinking, writing. A good pastor is busy at work. The ministry is work. The Bible says that if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. It's work. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you. That's your spiritual authority in the Lord. And admonish you. That's the teaching and preaching of God's word. And then he says this, verse 13. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. See, you ought to appreciate your pastor. A good pastor will work hard. A good pastor will accomplish much. A good pastor will be there when you need him and will uh, make himself available. And we understand that there are limits and boundaries and all those things. But we, the, we are laboring among you. We are over you spiritually and admonishing you with the word of God. That's what we do. That's what God has called us to do. Pastors, I don't, know, I don't know if all pastors are like this. I know for me it's this way, and maybe it's my own inability to, to, to get this under control. I, I do believe that God has given me the gift of administration. I think that um, I'm a, you, lo, the Lord has allowed me to be able to see things and organize things in, in a way that, that, that work well. So, but maybe this is just an area I need to organize. But, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't know, the pastors I know, we, you know, and I can tell you for myself, we don't take days off. It just doesn't really work. Every, t you know, every time I told my wife, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm tired of this, we're just gonna, I'm going to take a day off, it's a 24 hour period where nobody bothers me and somebody dies. You know, nobody ever likes to check with me before they die, you know, if, if, uh, if, if I'm taking the day off. Then some emergency happens. There's, some, there's this and that. There's a hospital visit. There's things that need to be done. And I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you, the ministry is work. Acknowledge that. Realize that. You have a man here that works a full-time job. Has a wife and children. And yet gets up and preaches three sermons that help you grow every week. And takes you hiking. And does this and does that and, 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 and takes care of you and, and has lunch with you and, 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 and all those things. A good pastor works hard, accomplishes much. And when a good pastor is accomplishing, then a good pastor should be appreciated. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 13, you say, how do we appreciate our pastor? Well, let me just give you some thoughts from this verse. Notice it says, and to esteem them. The word esteem means to be thoughtful, to think. A lot of appreciation just has to do with esteeming, being thoughtful. You know, you ought to be thoughtful with the Pazarnsky family for their special days, birthdays, anniversaries, birthdays for uh, Brother Jared and Miss Heidi, birthdays for the kids, anniversaries for the couple, just special days in their lives. Just be thoughtful. You ought to be thoughtful from time to time, you know, is there any way we can help? Is there a need we can fill? Is there, is there something we can do? It says, and to esteem them, then he says this, very highly. You ought to be thoughtful. You ought to be generous in love for their work's sake. And then he says, and be at peace among yourselves. You ought to appreciate your pastor. You ought to love on your pastor and love your pastor. Just, you know, just on the way here, my wife and I were joking. And, you know, you ever have those dark jokes where you're joking, but, you know, it's just kind of like, oh, you know. And we're like, man, it sure be nice if Brother Jared and Miss Heidi came back to Sacramento, you know. And then, of course, it's like, yeah, that would be nice. And then it's like, no, no, it wouldn't. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> that would mean something went really bad. <laughs> Wrong in Fresno. Here's what I'll tell you. Take care of them. We'll take them back. We'll take them away from you. Don't mistreat them. Love them. 
Realize that there's, there's work and there's effort and there's heartache and there's hard times. They go into ministry. Amen. Appreciate them. See, this church is getting ready to transition. An independent, autonomous local church. I hope you're excited. I, 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 I'm, I'm excited for what God is going to do. I'm excited to, for, the, for the steps. Brother Jared and I, even just this trip, we'll be start talking about how to transition this into an autonomous church. Uh, autonomous church. And, 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 you know, I'm excited to find out things like the name of, of this church. I really hope it's not, you know, Brother Jared Baptist Church. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he's the boss, so whatever. Um, but as you transition, as you transition, remember, you say, oh, man, we have a pastor now that's here. How do we treat him? You gotta obey him. You gotta follow him. You gotta provide for him, and you ought to appreciate him. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.